I invite the member for Richmond South Centre to lead the House in prayer <coughs> or reflection. Heavenly Father, as the events of the day unfold, we seek your guidance and your peace. We know that you are with us, and we ask that you guide us in our deliberation today. May we be temperate and respectful of one another as we exchange ideas on how to make the, this blessed and rich land that we call home a better place for our fellow citizens. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Introduction by members, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm honoured to have several guests joining us in the gallery to witness the introduction of historic legislation. Joining us from the First Nation Leadership Council, a Regional Chief Terry Teji of the BCAFN, and Ray Harris and Hugh Breaker of the First Nation Summit. I'd also like to introduce to the House Chief Rudy Paquette, Councillors Donovan Cameron, Col Colleen Tatusek, uh, uh, Justin Gaucher, and uh, Verita Owens. Also in the gallery is their advisor, Roger Harris, uh, who was, of course, the former MLA for Skeena. The Soto First Nation have long been a leader on the registration of title in particular and on the decolonization of provincial laws and policies in general. Chief Rudy Paquette and Council have been instrumental for years in having the forthcoming int uh, legislation introduced and I thank them for their leadership and for reminding us of the duty to, and role to address colonial practices and stem them where they occur. I'd also like to acknowledge Chief Corinna Lewin from the Chislata Carrier First Nation, who's joining us virtually. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to welcome lawyers Jack Woodward Casey, Mary Carstairs and James Hicklings, uh, Garth Thorogood and Michael Shepard, and members of our ministry team, Carolyn Kemper, Dale Morgan, and Kevin Ziegler. Thanks to all of you for your leadership on this important legislation and for your ongo ongoing guidance and partnership. Madam Clerk. Oh, Richmond Queensboro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, thank you first. Would have been my father, Jagdish Singh's 83rd birthday. Unfortunately, he passed away, as you know, you were at the funeral. He passed away last summer. So I wanted to take this opportunity as sort of my last happy birthday to my father and to remember him. Thank you. Minister of Labor. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to introduce to this house and everyone who's watching. 24-year-old Jajar Singh Man, who uh, at this young age uh, opened up a bake shop in Surrey Newton. Mr. Speaker, having a bake shop and starting your own business, I think you hear those stories all over the places, but this is unique. This is different. Uh, he, his passion started at a very young age, he tells me, but due to the stigma, in the community about certain career paths, it took a lot of challenges for him to decide what he wants to do until he went to the university and then he completed his degree in marketing. He is now breaking societal norms within our community and inspiring younger generations to follow their passion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he's not only a founder of his own bake shop, but with his creative ability, talents, and love for baking, he has participated in multiple shows on Food Net Network and recently has featured on season three of the popular Netflix show called Is It Cake? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, a spoiler, he made it to the final. So Mr. Speaker, I just want to say with the, with the support of his family, this young man is creating a new path, and I think uh, uh, he's being a great role model for the younger generation. And Mr. Speaker, now you have another good reason to come and visit Surrey Newton, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, come say hello to Jajar Singh. And I, I can tell you, the cardamom gulab jamun cake is delicious. Just go and try it. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'm going to introduce legislation about uh, spoiler alerts and how much time you have to give people to cover their ears as a cake is a big hit at our house, and that was 
That was uncalled for, uh, <laughs> Mr. Labor. Uh, joining us in the House today, uh, two members of the admin team from the Premier's office. Uh, all the members here know uh, we couldn't do our jobs without our administrative support. Uh, so grateful for their work every day. Uh, and uh, Jenlyn Hontiveros and Haley Hydman are here uh, from my office. I hope they enjoy a question period and uh, glad they're able to join us today. Thanks. Member for uh, Courtney East. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, Honourable Speaker, I'd just like to do a quick shout out and a happy birthday to my beautiful wife, Carrie Shapitka, who is having a happy birthday here today, April 2nd. I love you, HB. And for Hansard, that is initials H and B. Uh, don't ask me why, but uh, that's a long story. But anyways, uh, would the House please uh, join me in welcoming Carrie? Happy birthday. Member for Richmond South Centre. Richmond oh. South Center. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I just want to take this opportunity to wish Molly Pung happy 90th birthday. She'll be celebrating her 90th birthday on June 9th, 2024, and I'll ask the House to wish her happy birthday and many years of health, happiness, and love to come. Member for Study Panorama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to wish uh, a very special person in my life a happy birthday. He's been part of my life for 53 years. We got married in 1971, and uh, he celebrated his birthday this past weekend. And for a whole four months, he's going to be much older than I am. He's going to be two years older than I am, but only for four months. And then it'll be back to one again. But really, um, we often talk about our partners being our support, our foundation. Uh, I can say since I met him at the age of 18, he has been my strength. He has been the foundation. There have been some shaky times, but in 53 years, we expect those shaky times. But really, I uh, can say that I would not be the person I am today without having him as my life partner. Thank you. Minister of Jobs and Economic Development. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. There's been two important birthdays in my family since we were last here. My daughter, Esme, and my daughter-in-law, Amra, have both turned 28. This year is looking up for both of them. Esme has just been accepted to her master's degree at University of Toronto. Amra just got hired by Microsoft as a computer scientist. Congratulations to them both. Madam Clerk. Introduction of Bills. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present a message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, transmits here with Bill Number 13, entitled Land Title Property Act 2024, and recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. I move that the bill be introduced and read a first time now. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Bill 13, the Land Title and Property Law Amendment Act 2024 for first reading. It extends to all BC First Nations the ability to hold land in the name of a First Nation. The bill will, remend, will amend the Property Law Act to make clear that First Nations may hold and dispose of land and will amend the Land Title Act to address administrative requirements of the Land Title Office. Mr. Speaker, 2024 marks exactly 150 years since the BC Property Act was enacted. It explicitly restricted First Nation individuals from the ability to acquire land. English common law requires a legal entity to have expressed legislative authority to hold land. Since then, Mr. Speaker, most First Nation governments could not hold lands in the name of their First Nation. Our provincial policies and laws are often based on past colonial ideas and practices, which were inherently racist and harmful. That's why we are working to ensure provincial laws are aligned with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. These amendments will make small but important changes to reflect our government's commitment to reconciliation and to ensure no one faces discriminatory barriers to the ownership of land, something that should have happened a long time ago. It is my great honour to rise in the House today and move this motion. 
Members, the question is first reading of the bill. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Minister. Speaker, I move that the bill be placed on the orders of the day for second reading at the next sitting of the House after today. You have heard the question. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the honour to present a message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor transmits here with Bill Number 14, Intitulated Tennessee Statutes Amendment Act 2024, and recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move that the bill uh, be introduced and read a first time now. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to introduce the Tennessee Statutes Amendment Act. This bill delivers on our government's commitment to eliminate rent increases when people have children, to improve the security of tenants, and allow landlords to resolve disputes faster. This bill, if passed, will protect growing families by restricting rent increases if a tenant adds a child under the age of 19 to their household. To address bad faith evictions, this bill will ban evictions from personal use in pur purpose-built rentals buildings with five or more units and include a clear prohibition on issuing invalid eviction notices intended to harass or bully tenants into moving out. While most landlords and tenants play by the rules, we know that too many people in BC are still facing unfair evictions under false pretenses. To further deter bad faith evictions, this bill will also require landlords to use a web portal to generate a notice to evict a tenant for personal use. This change will help educate landlords on required conditions for personal use evictions while providing a standardized process for serving notice. It will also allow residential tenancy brands to properly track personal use evictions and will aid in the eviction dispute if they arise. Landlords need certainty that issues with problematic tenants can be resolved quickly. We have made good progress at the residential tenancy branch by cutting wait times for all tenancy hearings by more than 50% over last year. We've also fast-tracked hearings for unpaid rent and utilities, but we've heard from landlords that they need more support in dealing with some problematic tenants. This bill will help address that issue by adding authority to prescribe additional grounds for ending a problematic tenancy. With this bill, our government is taking thoughtful and measured approach to bad faith evictions and improving the security for tenants while maintaining a fair overall balance between the rights and interests of landlords and tenants. The question is first reading of the bill. All those in favour indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move the bill be placed on the orders of the day for second reading at the next sitting of the House after today. You have heard the question. All those in favour indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Statements by members. Member for Prince George, Wilmont. One of the things I love most about spring is the arrival of spring flowers, especially daffodils. And we can find them not just in our gardens on or around the legislative grounds, but as the symbol of the Canadian Cancer Society daffodil campaign. The Canadian Cancer Society raises funds to support and help people with cancer live longer, fuller lives. The spring campaign centers around the daffodil, one of the first flowers to bloom in spring. For those living with cancer, the daffodil represents strength, resiliency, courage, and hope. Every three minutes, someone in Canada hears the words, you have cancer, and their life changes forever. But there is hope. Your donation this Daffodil Month will fund world-leading research and compassionate support that could change the future for someone you love. So how can we help make a difference? Well, there are a number of ways, including making a personal donation, a monthly donation, host a fundraiser, or leave a legacy with a planned gift in your will. As we know, there are members in this chamber who have faced their own battle with cancer, and all of us have much loved family members, friends, and even work colleagues who are in the fight of their lives. Nearly half of all Canadians will face the devastating diagnosis of cancer in their lifetime, and that is why every spring for more than six decades, the Canadian Cancer Society has used the daffodil to encourage all of us to do our part. In Cancer Society, now is the time to help hope bloom for people facing cancer with your donation today. 
Your daffodil donation will help save and improve lives and ensure that no one has to face a cancer diagnosis alone. As we wear our daffodil pins this month, let us always remember that they are a symbol of our collective strength, representing renewal, inspiration, and hope. Member for Richmond South Centre. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Continuing from my previous statement on March 6, on Saturday, March 23rd, in partnership with the City of Richmond and the Richmond Garden City Conservation Society, my office had the support of over 125 volunteers who came together to plant the fourth Miyawaki Forest in B Richmond, BC. While working, I had some discussion that I wish to share in this chamber. The volunteers present were very diverse, and based on conversation, conversations, the majority were comfortable with Mandarin more than English. Some mentioned how they were frustrated by the discrimination against Chinese Canadians, who are often portrayed as individuals who came to this country merely to benefit from services, beauty, and abundance, and who do not contribute, sacrifice, or care about our community. My experience proves quite the contrary. As MLA, I have witnessed how often Chinese Canadians have taken on a leadership role in fundraising for many important causes, such as health care, environmental sustainability, and cultural exchange. When it comes to volunteering, as evidenced by the recent Miyawaki forest planting and invasive species removal, Chinese Canadians come out in strong numbers to serve causes that beautify, better, and benefit our neighborhoods. In my community hubs, the seniors volunteer their time to help other seniors improve their English and self-care. Chinese Canadians' contribu contributions serve as a great reminder of how multiculturalism truly empowers our profit to become a better place for all. Multiculturalism also helps Richmond benefit from other groups such as Ukrainian, Filipino, South Asians, English, German, Scouts, and Irish, as they each bring their own unique, culturally rich perspectives to beautifying and bettering Richmond in meaningful, significant, and constructive manners. However, when individuals use cultural differences and language barriers to spread misinformation and disinformation, it ultimately fosters conditions where racism and discrimination thrive. That is why it is crucial to combat against disinformation and misinformation while nurturing social connectedness, truth, and open dialogues, so the multiculturalism can truly thrive and continue to enrich our community. Member for City South. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise today in recognition of Sikh Heritage Month. Today, as we celebrate Sikh Heritage Month, we're not just commemor commemorating rather Sikh history and contributions, we're embracing the vibrant diversity seen throughout British Columbia. This April, we recognize the profound influence of the Sikh community on our province's cultural and societal fabric. This past weekend, at the Sikh Heritage BC kickoff event, I was moved by the stories of resilience, perseverance, and a deep commitment to community values. For well over a century, Sikhs have enriched British Columbia, contributing significantly to our economic growth and prosperity. As we celebrate this month, I'd like to encourage all members of this House to explore Sikh traditions and teachings and advocate for equality, social justice, and selfless service. This month also gives us a chance to reflect on the diverse roles Sikh Canadians play across various sectors, politics, business, education, and the arts. I'd also like to recognize and express my gratitude for their significant community service. At a time when many British Columbians are struggling with the cost of everyday life, their generosity has benefited countless families in every corner of our province. Throughout this month, let us commit to learning more about Sikh history and culture, because by engaging more deeply in supporting the values of diversity and inclusivity, we do more than honor the Sikh community we strengthen the bonds that unite us as British Columbians. As legislators, it's crucial that we help all British Columbians have a voice in this space. And the more we learn, the more we can better represent them and their community's needs. Thank you. Member for Langley East. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. As Parliamentary Secretary for Community Development and Nonprofits, I have the privilege to meet and work with so many fantastic nonprofits who work hard to deliver important services in our communities. These organizations oversee countless vital services 
that change lives in our province on a daily basis. But today I want to highlight their work on housing. Nonprofit providers are invaluable partners to our government in delivering safe and affordable housing in our province. The challenges we face in this housing crisis are urgent and complex, and we need to take a forward thinking approach to solving them. That means leaning on the skill and expertise of the nonprofits who know their communities best, whether it's through the Community Housing Fund, Housing Hub, BC Builds, or otherwise. I am so grateful for our amazing nonprofit partners who step up with a vision and commitment to bring affordable housing to fruition as part of our government strategy to build thousands of affordable, sustainable homes for people across the province. I had the opportunity to be part of an opening of one such project last week in the township of Langley. Thanks to our partnership with Christian Life Assembly Housing Society, families, seniors, and individuals in the Langley region will soon be moving into 98 affordable rental homes at the uh, Jenny Gallardi place. This project is a much welcomed addition to the township of Langley, ensuring people with low and moderate incomes aren't forced to move away from the community that they love. We are so fortunate to have such fantastic partners in our province. Thank you to all of the nonprofits throughout British Columbia for their work each and every day to deliver safe and affordable housing options to people in British Columbia. I am very grateful to have the opportunity to work with you to protect and expand nonprofit, non-market, and co-op housing in British Columbia. Would the House please join me in thanking the nonprofits for the important work that they do to provide housing for British Columbians? Thank you. Member for West Vancouver, C to Sky. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As many of us will know, March was uh, Kidney Health Month a month dedicated to raising awareness about kidney health in our communities. In March, uh, Kidney Foundation volunteers met with many MLAs uh, to share their important kidney health information and to provide resources for their constituency offices. I had the opportunity to catch up with two of my constituents and longtime friends, Al Alexis and Rob Mackay Dunn, whose world was turned upside down with Ali's uh, surprise diagnosis of kidney disease in August 2018. An otherwise active and completely healthy newlywed, Ali had been quietly living with kidney disease for an indeterminate amount of time only to find out about her, her diagnosis or her illness during a routine pregnancy screening. As I learned, when kidneys are working well, it's easy to take them for granted. Your kidneys are vital organs that are essential for survival. And when your kidneys fail, the options are limited and challenging for individuals and families. They're faced with highly disruptive dialysis or a life-saving transplant because, Mr. Speaker, there is no cure. And kidney disease is much more prevalent than you may think. One in 10 British Columbians are living with kidney disease and surprisingly, 45% of those patients are under 45. As I learned, screening and early detection is critical to protecting the health of your kidneys, and many people don't even know they're living with kidney disease until it's too late. In fact, you can be like Alexis and lose up to 80% of your kidney function and not even know it, because there are no visible symptoms. Fortunately, the Kidney Foundation has numerous programs to help improve the quality of life and meet the diverse needs of those living with kidney disease and their families, including the newly launched Kidney Wellness Hub. Please join me, the Kidney Foundation, Alexis and Rob in urging all British Columbians to learn more about their kidneys, including asking your doctor for routine screening at your next checkup. Uh, learn more at kidney.ca. Member for Vancouver West End. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Well, I remember it very clearly. I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago uh, in my constituency in the West End, and a senior loudly shouted, what? I can get $400? And I said, yes, you can. He said, no, you've got to be kidding me. And I said, yes, you can. Do you file your, file your taxes? Yes, he did. Uh, how much do you make? He said, uh, I don't know, under 600000 
And I laughed and I said, under 600,000? He said, just kidding you, you politicians make all sorts of money. I make maybe 40,000 on a good year because he still works a bit, more likely around 30,000. I said, well, you qualify. He said, what do you mean I qualify? I said, the renter's tax credit. He said, I never heard of that. Uh, I said, well, do you file your own taxes? He said, yeah, I do. I never saw a credit for that. I said, well, you got to look at the BC tax credit. You got to look at form BC 479 and fill it out and put down your rent amounts, put down your income, and you should be fine. And since that time, I've talked to lots of folks in my community, and they don't know about the renter's tax credit, Honourable Speaker. Politicians often want credit for what they do, but I don't think we've done a good job selling the renter's tax credit so folks understand that they actually get that money. They don't have to do anything aside from file their taxes and put in the renter's tax credit information there. Now, if they make under $80,000, it's not the same $400, but they will be making money as well. 80% of renters qualify for that tax credit. So, you know, banning rent evictions, the fixed term tenancy, the geographic area increase clause, holding rent to inflation or below instead of what could have been a 7% rent increase this year, Honourable Speaker, adding on the renter's tax credit. These are good news things for renters, Honourable Speaker. I want every renter to know that they qualify if they're making under $80,000 a year net uh, for their family. They will get that tax credit. They deserve it. Renters deserve that support, and I'm glad they're getting it. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Member for Prince George Wilmont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, while well, other premiers, including Manitoba's NDP Premier Wab Canoe, fought against the carbon tax hike, this premier and his government doubled down. Yesterday, the NDP hiked the carbon tax in British Columbia by 23% in a cruel April Fool's joke, making the cost of gas, groceries, and home heating even more expensive. In much of BC today, gas prices are well over $2 a liter, the highest gas price and gas taxes in North America. No wonder thousands of families are choosing to leave British Columbia. So with families unable to afford basic necessities, why does the Premier insist on punishing people with even higher costs for gas and groceries? Premier. Honourable Speaker, uh, we know a lot of British Columbians are struggling with affordability right now, which is why everything from our budget uh, this year, but really from the first days of our government, we've taken action to support them with costs, including the costs of driving. You know, we did, we were the government that took the opposition's tolls off the bridges. Uh, we are the government that reduced ICBC rates by 20% and provided ICBC rebates to people when we fixed the mess that they left behind. We're the government that brought in subsidized childcare, daycare, so that families can afford uh, to go, actually go to work. Um, and we're going to continue to do that important work. Uh, the member surprises me um, because she was a very vocal advocate uh, for the carbon tax. I think that all British Columbians see the forest fires, the drought, the impacts on farmers, on our province right now, and they want a government that will continue to take action on, on climate change. That's why. Although there is a federally mandated, mandated carbon tax increase, we're refunding the full amount back plus more to British Columbians to support them with affordability. But the member herself said to News 1130, quote, I think people do want to see environmental leadership in the province, and obviously the carbon tax is one of the things where British Columbia led. That was the member herself that said that. And we could do that for member after member on the other side of the House about the carbon tax, Honourable Speaker. Member for Prince George Wilmot Supplemental. Well, uh, nice try uh, to the Premier of British Columbia. Let's be clear about this. Uh, the carbon tax we introduced was revenue neutral with every cent being returned to British Columbians, something that isn't happening under this Premier's watch. And what the Premier has managed to do, actually, is quite, uh, when you think about it, unite Premiers of every single political stripe uh, across the country in opposing the increase. Whether they're NDP, Conservative or Liberal, guess what? They all are fighting the carbon tax, not this Premier. And what has this government done? They have forced over 200,000 British Columbians to use a food bank every single month. 
Over the next three years, $9 billion will be collected by this Premier from British Columbians, and only a third of that will be returned to them. Families are struggling in this province. The Premier knows it. He is out of touch. And by increasing the car costly carbon tax, he will continue to do that by over 30 cents up till 2030. 30 cents a litre by 2030. As families in British Columbians, Columbia continue to struggle, why is the Premier forcing them to pay higher prices for gas, for groceries and home heating? Premier. Well, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, our government uh, definitely recognizes that British Columbians are struggling right now. That's why our focus from day one has been about reducing costs for British Columbians. In fact, just this week, uh, British Columbians opening their hydro bills will see a $100 credit supporting them with the cost of electricity. Oh, the, the opposition stops. The opposition stops because they never did that, Honourable Speaker. They didn't support British Columbians with the costs that they faced. Our government has done that since day one. Now, I realize that the members across the way have completely changed their position on this issue under pressure from uh, the Conservative Party. Now, oh, okay, well, well here, uh, December, members, December members, 2022, members. the leader of the opposition, quote, I want us to be the leader on climate that we were when Gordon Campbell and our government brought in North America's first carbon tax. Uh, uh, 2020, September 2023, the Leader of the Opposition, quote, if you want people to change behaviour, you put a cost to it and you ask them to consider shifting their behaviour, talking about the carbon tax. Now, uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, the member suggests this was a revenue neutral plan. We all know what they did with the money. They gave a, gave a massive tax cut to corporations. Members. They didn't send it back to British Columbians. Members. Members. They didn't send it back to British Columbians like we are, Honourable Speaker. They gave a $450 million annual tax cut to big corporations in the province. Colonna Mission. This government seems convinced to take tax dollars and give rebate pennies. What this Premier, in all of his answers so far, fails to realize is that every single dollar on tax, on groceries, on heating, is a direct hit to those that are barely hanging on. People like Pamela, a 64-year-old woman grappling with health issues and currently living in a travel trailer outside of Kelowna. She says, and I quote, we pay, 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 but we get no rebates. The middle class are going to be financially driven to food banks or mortgage default, end quote. Why does the Premier continue to pile on pain and ignore people like Pamela? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Everything this government has done since 2017 has been for people. Whether it's cutting childcare costs Mem by two thirds. Members. Minister will continue. Whether it's cutting childcare costs by two thirds, whether it's reducing ICBC rates by hundreds of dollars, whether it's reversing and holding steady. BC hydro rates as opposed to the plan those on the other side had when they were in government, which was to drive them members, up members. through the roof. We've paid attention to the needs of people. This budget pays attention to the needs of people, and every penny in yesterday's carbon tax increase is going back to people, low- and middle-income people, through the Climate Action Tax Credit. Kulona Mission Supplemental. Well, it's interesting that the minister uh, talks about childcare when we have 10,600 less spaces today than we did in 2019. Or ICBC and lessening rates. Well, we actually have uh, jacked up rates of 40% that then they gave back a pittance to and lowered by 25. This NDP government 
Only this NDP government could attempt Members. to justify a 23% tax increase that no one wants, no one can afford, and is deepening the cost of living crisis in what is already Canada's most ex expensive province to live. A retired teacher wrote to me to say, and I quote, I don't know anyone who has received a carbon tax credit. I'm actually being hit with a tax that I cannot in any way minimize. I'm essentially screwed, end quote. The carbon tax will gouge $9 billion from British Columbians over the next three years, with only a fraction returned through rebates. When will the Premier stop his relentless assault on affordability that is making the NDP's cost of living crisis worse? Here, here. Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only relentless assault from those on this side of the House is on unaffordability. Unaffordability that we take on every single day. In this year's budget, we're putting up to $500 back in people's pockets through the new BC Family Benefit Bonus. 25% more families will benefit. We're taking every penny of the carbon tax increase and putting it to low and middle income members, people members. through the Climate Action Tax Credit. Members. Members. Minister will continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If we do want to talk about unaffordability, if we do want to talk about a tax on British Columbians, let's look at the record of the Leader of the Opposition. Tax cuts for the top 2 per cent of British Columbians. Tax hikes for the top 2 per cent of British Columbians. Mem members, members. $450 million in tax cuts to big business and calling it revenue neutrality. Mem members, members will come to order. Members, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I said, tax cuts for the top 2 per cent, tax cuts for big business, ICBC rates hiked 11 per cent for British Columbians, medical services plan premiums by 10 per cent, and hydro rates that were going through the roof so they can raid BC Hydro and call it a balanced budget. We've changed that. We're going to continue to change that. If they don't like it. I get it. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I cannot think of a group that could be happier about this debate in here over whether we put a price on carbon pollution than the oil and gas industry, which last year, in Canada alone, took $70 billion in profits from the people of Canada. $70 billion in profits. Why in the world are we not talking about that? Political conversations around the carbon tax and rebate have distracted us from the big picture. If we want to meet our climate goals, BC's biggest polluters need to pay their fair share. Research shows that industrial carbon pricing reduces emissions more than consumer pricing, but questions remain around the details of BC's new output-based pricing system, which allows BC's biggest polluters to use offsets and credits for a portion of their emissions. However, research has found that carbon offsets are often unreliable and overcount emissions reductions. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. How will this government guarantee that their carbon offsets are effective and that regulations for industry ensure big polluters pay their fair share? Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question because it, it points out uh, important measures that this government has taken to ensure that when offsets are allowed, as with the new Forest Carbon Offset Protocol 2, we ensure that they meet the highest international standards. That means they must be additional. That means 
they must not be double counted, and that means that they will stand up to international standards. Those are the standards that we will apply to offsets used under the output-based pricing system, and we have ensured that we set an output-based pricing system that retains an important price signal for industry while ensuring that industry survives to implement the emission reductions and employ British Columbians. Leader of Third Party Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The price signal that this government has given to the oil and gas industry is that they will continue to give them tax cuts and subsidies. Tax cuts and subsidies for the biggest polluters means less funding for initiatives that lower emissions and address the cost of living. At least 5.34 billion in provincial subsidies are planned for LNG Canada. Meanwhile, this year's budget only includes 1.3 billion in new spending for climate-related initiatives. Experts predict a highly uncertain future for profit profitability of BC's LNG industry, but this government continues to subsidize and expand the industry. Charging polluters their fair share would mean more money for transit, renewal, renewables, and people in BC, all of which would create jobs, improve air quality, and promote long-term affordability by reducing reliance on polluting fossil fuels. This government falls short on climate spending and continues to subsidize large polluters. Two steps, both in the wrong direction. Again, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Can he explain why this government continues to subsidize the fossil fuel industry, an industry that brought in 70 billion in profits just in Canada in 2022? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as I assume the uh, leader of the third party knows, we have committed to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. And we started with the largest single fossil fuel subsidy, the deep well royalty credit. We're continuing to ensure that we invest in renewables, that we encourage outside investment in alternate forms of clean energy. We are making the transition we are working on it. We have a Clean Energy and Major Projects Office. We have a suite of policies, including one that apparently uh, the member missed an announcement of last Thursday that will ensure that we hit our climate targets for the oil and gas sector and support the transition to clean, renewable energy for British Columbians and also those to whom we can export both technologies and product. House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, yesterday was April Fool's Day, and this MDP Premier played a joke on all British Columbians because on April 1st, he raised the carbon tax again. Last fall, BC Conservatives spoke about the fact that this MDP carbon tax is taking two chickens out of every pot every time British Columbians fill up their tank. Mr. Speaker, now we have two chickens who refuse to axe the tax and spike the hype. This NDP Premier and his boss in Ottawa, Justin Trudeau. Mr. Speaker, there is a movement across this country and the province. People are hanging by a thread. They can't afford gas. They can't afford heating. They can't afford groceries for their families. They're demanding that this carbon tax be eliminated and to their credit, Almost every single other Premier in Canada has joined them in calling for the carbon tax to be eliminated. But here in BC, Members. this unelected Premier is the holdup. My Alexi question to the Members. Premier, Mr. Speaker, Members. why does he insist Mem on being the only provincial leader that wants to increase the cost for citizens rather than making life affordable for everyday, hard-working British Columbians by axing the tax and spiking this hike. Did you hear the question? <laughs> Minister. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier. Well, if we're going to talk about hardworking British Columbians who are struggling to survive, perhaps uh, the members of the Conservative Party who sit on the other side of the House might want to think back to all the different measures this government introduced on housing, on MSP, on childcare, on family benefits that they opposed. Every 
single time there was an opportunity to make life more affordable for British Columbians, they said no. But they found a new mantra, Mr. Speaker. They think three simple words will convince British Columbians that they're on their side. We know that British Columbians see the BC family benefit. They see a two-thirds reduction in childcare costs. They remember we took the toll off bridges. They know that climate change affects them not only in terms of their lives and their children's future, but in the pocketbook when wildfires, droughts, and floods threaten their communities, and then they have to pay insurance rates. Mr. Speaker, the only game of chicken going on here is between the Conservatives and the official opposition to see who can retreat from climate action fastest. Members, House Leader of the Fourth Party. Mr. Speaker, we know the carbon tax just doesn't artificially inflate the price of fuel. It raises the cost of absolutely everything, from the park farmer who picks the food, to the trucker who transports the food, to the grocery stores that sell the food. There is a carbon tax inflating the cost of everything in this province. Mr. Speaker, it's common sense which is something that does not seem to exist in the Premier's office. Taxing people into poverty won't change the weather. Let me speak plainly, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier. My question to the Premier. The carbon tax scam is over. The people are waking up and they want their money back. Will you listen to the people of this province or will they have to throw you and your baloney party out of office before you actually get the message? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the member should know, although I'm sure the member will not say it publicly, every cent of yesterday's carbon tax increase is going back to low and middle income British Columbians through the Climate Action Tax Credit. And as the member should also know, our government is determined to support farmers and ranchers right now. Right now, Mr. Speaker, farmers are eligible for PST exemptions for heat, for natural gas, for fuel oil, for tractors, for combines, for incubators, and more. And BC farmers, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite who should know this, BC farmers can also claim a point of sale carbon tax and motor fuel tax exemption on colored gasoline and colored fuel. House Leader, official opposition. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the NDP's uh, reckless uh, decriminalization of hard drugs has unleashed chaos and a, and a public safety crisis. Once safe public spaces like Tim Hortons, public transit, and even hospitals are now hotspots for open drug use. This chaos is the direct result of the NDP's total neglect when they plunged ahead with their decriminalization experiment. Yet all we hear all we hear is feigned outrage from the guy responsible, the public safety minister, declaring it absolutely outrageous, absolutely frustrated, and just disgusted. What's missing from the NDP and from this minister is action to fix this crisis. So the question to the Premier is this. Since it, it's this NDP Premier that created this mess, when will he scrap his dangerous and failed experiment to decriminalize hard drugs here in British Columbia? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the question uh, from the member. Uh, the member will know and, uh, that uh, using drugs in a Tim Hortons is not legal. It's illegal. It's unacceptable. It has absolutely nothing to do with decriminalization, but has, it has everything to do with people deciding that that's what they want to do. And guess what? They will be, can be arrested. They can be hauled out of there as they should be. Members, 
Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. No. Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. That's why we've got our Safer Communities Action Plan. That's why we've given additional resources to police to be able to combat and fight drug trafficking, Honourable Speaker, in this province. That's what we're going to continue to do, Honourable Speaker, because we know that keeping streets and communities safe is a public priority. It's why we've made significant investments in policing, Honourable Speaker, hiring more than 256 RCMP officers in small rural communities across this, across this province, so that we've also got more officers in terms of specialty teams Teams, Honourable Speaker. It's why we've given police additional resources in terms of mental health, health uh, resources to be able to deal with mental health cases. But let's be clear, Honourable Speaker, someone uses drugs in the Tim Hortons, they're going to be arrested, they're going to be hauled out, they should be charged, and that's what we're going to make sure happens. House Leader Supplemental. Well, Mr. Speaker, there it is, exactly what I said. There's the feigned outrage that we hear over and over and over again from this, from this minister. And the reality is this, that these are not isolated incidents anymore. These are now the new normal, new normal for public spaces and for businesses as a direct result of the policy choices, the reckless policy choices of this NDP government. Mr. Speaker, it's this NDP Premier who made the deliberate policy choice to send British Columbians careening down the path of decriminalized dr drugs like heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. And daily, we see open drug use in restaurants like Tim Hortons, brazen shootings in Vancouver, and more deadly stabbings like the one in Victoria on the recent weekend. Instead of expressing feigned outrage, why won't this NDP Premier do the right thing and end his failed and reckless decriminalization of hard drugs in British Columbia today? Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. The only feigned outrage, Honourable Speaker, is the new normal from the other side of the House, which every day wants to reject the fact that it supported decriminalization, because every day, Honourable Speaker, that side of the House sees those two members in the BC Conservative Party eating their lunch, their dinner, their supper, poll after poll after poll, Honourable Speaker. We are going to continue. Members, Shh. Minister, Minister has the floor. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Using, use, member, <laughs> member for Abbotsford South. It's not funny. Please continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. All of us in this House are concerned about criminal activity, whether it's by drug dealers, those who prey on the unfortunate, Honourable Speaker. That's why we've worked with communities. That's why we're seeking an injunction, so that we can regulate where drug use takes place, Honourable Speaker, because we can regulate tobacco use, we can regulate cannabis use, we can regulate alcohol. We also believe that we should be able to regulate where people use illicit substances, Honourable Speaker, and guess what? A Tim Hortons is not one of them, a business is not one of them, Honourable Speaker, and we will do everything we can to ensure that our communities are kept safe. Member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just as the NDP's reckless decriminalization is creating chaos, investigative journalists have uncovered a shocking kickback scheme by predatory pharmacies. These pharmacies have been exposed for paying cash incentives to vulnerable patients with substance use disorders, often without correctly dispensing the drugs. This illegal kickback not only fuels more addiction and diversion, it is yet another blatant example of the NDP's government failure in oversight and failure in enforcement. How long will this Premier allow these egregious abuses to continue under his watch, which is endangering lives and exploiting the vulnerable for profit? Minister of Health. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And the position of the government is clear. This isn't allowed. It shouldn't be allowed, uh, Honourable Speaker. And the appropriate authorities are taking action. Honourable Speaker, we don't announce investigations, we announce the results of investigations, but I can assure everybody, anyone thinks that this is acceptable or should be allowed, Honourable Speaker, they are incorrect. Action will be taken and action is being taken. 
Member for Cambridge, North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's one kickback scheme to another uh, with this government, Mr. Speaker. So let's look, let's look at what's happened with the 23% increase in carbon tax and how this government is spending those carbon tax funds. Hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars through carbon tax is going to the Clean BC Go Electric program. A pro subset of that program, the ARC program, is now under fire for a kickback scheme. The NDP appointed consultants overseeing the grant approvals are demanding a 20% success fee from applicants for advisory services. These are the same people that actually decide who actually gets the money. Companies that reject the unethical demands are finding that their applications are rejected with strong encouragement to reapply through the, the adjudicators for the success fee attached. Will the Premier commit to an independent investigation to root out the kickbacks and corruption in his cost BC grant programs? Minister of Fine Energy and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question and for raising the programs that our government is using to support the switch from electrification, or from, pardon me, fossil fuels to BC's clean electricity. Mr. Speaker, this is uh, something that British Columbians have said over and over that it, they want to do, and they're showing us that by their actions. They're making the switch to electric heat pumps to heat their homes, more comfortable heating, lower pollution. They're making the switch in their vehicles. But, Mr. Speaker, we know it's not just light-duty vehicles where we need to see these changes. It's in medium and heavy-duty spaces, and we're seeing the transition in trucking, for example, looking at the uh, excellent hydrogen technologies that are being developed here in British Columbia so that we can make these changes. Mr. Speaker, a very important part of this technology development, of course, is supporting companies, innovators here in British Columbia in the work that they're doing to bring these technologies alive to be able to prove them, to pilot them, to scale them up and to commercialize them. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's this work that we do together that's going to see the transition from fossil fuels into clean electricity. It's a transition our government is fully behind and we won't stop. The bell and the question period. Members, I have the honor of presenting a report from the Auditor General of British Columbia, BC's Toxic Drug Crisis, Implementation of Harm Reduction Programs. Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. In the main chamber, call second reading on Bill 11, Vancouver Charter Act. Douglas for committee room, call committee of supply of Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness. In the Birch Committee Room, call Committee of Supply for Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Committee Chairs.
Recognizing the Minister of Municipal Affairs on Bill 11. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the bill now be read a second time. Minister. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased, to, I'm pleased to rise today in the House to speak to this important legislation. I'm honored as the Minister of Municipal Affairs to be tabling this bill in the House. Bill 11, the Vancouver Charter Amendment Act 2024, includes the important goals of recognizing First Nations alongside with other levels of government that qualify for exemption from two of the City of Vancouver's development cost charges for social housing projects. To achieve this goal, Bill 11 proposes amendments to the Vancouver Charter. The proposed legislation responds to a specific request made by the City of Vancouver and supports provincial priorities alongside and related to reconciliation and affordable housing supply. Authorized under the Vancouver Charter, a development cost levy is a charge that the city can impose on a property developer to fund specific city infrastructures, including parks, childcare facilities, replacement housing, and engineering infrastructure such as water and roads. Currently, the city is authorized to exempt social housing projects from this levy where the land is owned by the federal or provincial government, the city of Vancouver, or a nonprofit organization. It is important to clarify that development cost charges do not apply on reserve lands within the city of Vancouver. This proposal relates to uh, specifically to privately held lands owned by First Nations. This legislation also provides a parallel amendment to the Vancouver Charter's new amenity cost charge, the ACC provision. ACCs were introduced by Bill 46 in fall 2023. The proposed amendments would exempt First Nations from ACCs for social housing projects. Exempting First Nations from the development cost charges for social housing projects in Vancouver alongside other levels of government is a change that supports reconciliation. First Nations have potential to be a significant supplier of housing and accelerating housing supply is a shared priority and would support the implementation of BC's Homes for People's Plan. Specifically, the pillar of delivering better and more affordable homes. Madam Speaker, our government is listening to the needs and requests of local communities. This amendment supports reconciliation efforts by ensuring First Nations in BC are recognized as governments in the legislation alongside other levels of government exempt from the development cost levy and the amenity cost charges for social housing projects built in Vancouver. The proposed amendment in Bill 11 is supported by the City of Vancouver. With that, Honourable Speaker, I want to thank you and all the members of this House, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues uh, in the continued debate today on the second reading of this bill. Recognizing the member from Penticton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and to the Minister, uh, nice to see you as always. Um, it's my pleasure today uh, to rise and speak to Bill 11. My understanding is this bill amends the Vancouver Charter to extend exemptions from development cost levies um, and amenity cost charges to First Nations and First Nations corporations for social housing projects on their lands. It aligns, uh, it aligns them, and I say First Nations, with existing exemptions that other government entities and nonprofits um, organizations have. And uh, we all realize that if you want to make housing more affordable, you need to make it less expensive, especially in these days that we're all facing. Unfortunately, after seven years of adding um, additional red tape and government bureaucracy, we desperately need to add to our uh, housing supply. And not only in Vancouver, we need to do it throughout the entire province. But today we are speaking about the Vancouver Charter and, and Vancouver area. We support increasing housing supply and are glad to see some of the admissions by the government that taxes and DC charges are a barrier to housing. However, this submission begs the question on why we are not looking at additional taxation cutting across the board of the entire province to make a difference. Um, also, uh, the additional taxes and fees that have come in with the current government, including additional charges with carbon tax, are making everything more expensive these days for all of British Columbians. However, we welcome this change and we are ready to speed the process along so that it can become law and uh, just before I sit down, Madam Chair, you know, as a child growing up in a family that was involved in retail, and I, I remember building my first house, 
in uh, 1983 I started it. Um, I was paying 22, 22 and a half if I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> interest on a, on a construction loan. And um, unfortunately, uh, um, I ended up having to sell the home because the trust kept on marching along. And uh, I was raised, as I said, to really respect uh, inflationary means, regulation means, and also taxation means. And I think that's something that we all, I mean the entirety of this house, we have to take a look. We all want to put roofs over, people's, um, over people uh, and give them the opportunity of home ownership because that is their largest investment in their life. Even if they're renting, it's still an investment for them to be able to stick money away on the side for their future. And I just hope that we all can collectively work towards ensuring that people have that opportunity. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And to the Minister, I look for the opportunity uh, during the committee stage on the bill. So thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further speakers, Minister of Municipal Affairs, would you like to close debate? Uh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker, uh, and I, I thank the member from Penticton for his remarks. I look forward to continued uh, discussion and debate on Bill 11. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I move second reading. Members, the question is second reading of Bill, 9, uh, Bill 11, uh, Vancouver Charter Amendment Act 2024. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Madam Chair, I move that the bill be referred to a committee of the whole uh, House to be considered at the next sitting of the House after today. Members, you've heard the question. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carried. Government House Leader. Thank you, Speaker. I call second reading Bill 12, the Public Health Accountability and Cost Recovery Act. Recognizing the Attorney General. Um, I move that the bill be now be read a second time. The Public Health Accountability and Reco Cost Recovery Act provides a general, generally applicable litigation-based mechanism for government, excuse me, for government to recover health care costs and public health-related expenditures from wrongdoers. This new act follows the model of the Tobacco Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act and the Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act by creating a <coughs> excuse me, creating a statutory tort and providing government with a direct action to recover the cost of health care benefits from wrongdoers who have committed health-related health wrongs. The two existing acts have been vigorously tested in courts and government has either successfully defended them or refined them to ensure their validity and success. This new generally, generally applicable and wide-ranging act will build on the success of those acts to ensure wrongdoers can be held to account. The financial burden of many wrongdoers has too often been paid for by the province. But this new act, with this new act, the government will be able to hold wrongdoers accountable and ensure that financial burden is placed on the wrongdoer and not the province. This act should, be, should encourage those who would prioritize profit over the health and well-being of people living in British Columbia to reconsider this approach. Unlike the tobacco and opioid acts, which focus on specific wrongdoings related to tobacco and opioid products, respectively, this new act is generally applicable and wide-ranging to any wrongdoer that causes or contributes to disease, energy, in injury, or illness, or the risk of disease, injury, or illness. And a health-related wrong is defined broadly as a breach of a duty or obligation owed to people living in British Columbia or a tort. This broad definition helps ensure that wrongdoers, all wrongdoers, regardless of if they are individuals, corporations, or other entities can be held fully accountable for their conduct. In addition, it is flexible and will adopt duties and obligations that are imposed in the, in the future and torts that have yet to be created by the courts. With this act, government will be, will be able to make claims in cases where there is a risk of disease, injury, or illness, and not just in cases where harm is materialized. This is important as government can incur significant costs when addressing the risk before they turn into disease, injury, or illness. Government will be able to claim for those costs that have already been incurred and for those health care benefits that are reasonably expected to be incurred in the future. It is for this reason that the recoverable costs are broadly defined to capture all of government expenditures that are incurred when responding to a disease, injury, or illness caused by a wrongdoer. These costs can include health care costs like doctor appointments or, and hospital treatments, but can also include the costs of proactive and preventative measures that are used to address the risk of disease, injury, or illness. This can include things like educational campaigns, medical monitoring, or, and cessation programs. 
Kids and young people are often the most vulnerable, therefore it's important that the costs incurred by schools when they, are res they respond to wrongdoings caused by disease, injury, illness are also included. The Public Health Accountability and Cost Recovery Act contains many procedural features from the Tobacco and Opioid Acts that allow government to, to prove claims for costs of health care benefits accurately and enable litigation to proceed efficiently while preserving fairness. Claims can be brought on an aggregate basis to recover costs, uh, government costs at a population level, level, not just in relation to individuals. Under this new act, statistical and research-based information can also be used as evidence to prove liability causation and the amount owed by the wrongdoer. It also provides for important presumptions of causation of disease, injury, or illness that will facilitate findings of liability in complex situations where a defendant has committed a wrong that creates a risk of disease, injury, or illness. This shifts the burden to defendants to prove that they did not cause disease, disease um, illness or injury to people in British Columbia. This new act further provides for a multi-crown class action as was in, in, innovated in the opioid legislation where the government of British Columbia can lead a lawsuit on behalf of the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in Canada. BC has been a leader in tobacco and opioid litigation and intends to continue to lead the way in protecting the health of those living in British Columbia with this new act. Thank you, Attorney General. Recognizing the member from Vancouver, Langara. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I, I will be the designated speaker on this bill for the official opposition, the BC United Caucus. And uh, given the Attorney General's uh, pace under which her second reading speech uh, uh, was provided, I think it's important that we take the time in this chamber to uh, understand the broad scope of this bill, Bill 12. I know when this bill was first presented by the Premier and the Attorney General that it was framed in a way to deal with some of the social harms that we see from social media. And that certainly is a concern that we all share in this house. Whether it is the online exploitation of young children, teenagers, through sextortion, and of course we know the very unfortunate and tragic outcome result for uh, the Prince George boy, Carson Cleland. There have cer certainly been others that have been subject to online bullying and other challenges under social media that we know these platforms need correct and appropriate constraints around by governments. This is the reason why, as I understand it, the federal government has introduced BC Bill C-63, the Online Harms Act. There's been a lot of dialogue that I see considerations around that bill, but certainly as we look at the importance of some of the efforts under that bill, to regulate the internet space, particularly when it comes to the impact on young people and children. But Madam Speaker, this bill, Bill 12, is not that. This bill is very broad and is not specific in the ways that we've seen under the previous bills by successive governments in this province. One, to deal with cigarette smoking. The other, to do with opioids. In both cases, Madam Speaker, there was specific industries, private actors, being regulated and addressed. We have the Tobacco Damages and Healthcare Cost Recovery Act 
and the Opioid Damages and Healthcare Cost Recovery Act, which was dealt with in 2018, the second act. I did have the occasion as the Attorney General critic back then to work through that bill with the Premier as he was then the Attorney General. But I know, Madam Speaker, in the context of this bill, Bill 12, that is being presented here, that there have been concerns raised. There's been a letter provided by two dozen business organizations, including the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, the Retail Council of Canada, Able BC, BC Craft Brewers, British Columbia Hotel Association, Rural Liquor Store Advisory Society, New Wave Wine Society, BC Craft Distillers Guild, Kofi itself, Restaurants Canada, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers, the BC Business Council itself, the Food Health Consumer Products of Canada, Tourism Association of BC, the Canadian Beverage Association, and the BC Restaurants Federation Association. I, these are just a number. Well, there's also the BC Chamber of Commerce, of course, uh, the Chemistry Industry Association of BC, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. I believe I've cited most of the organizations whose names are attached to this letter that was written to the Premier and the Attorney General dated March 8, 28th. This is a letter that came out just a few days ago, prior to this debate. And Madam Speaker, if I had the opportunity as I stood up in question period today at the end, before, I was, before it ended, I will ask the government to do what I was going to ask in question period today. which is in view of the concerns and the considerations expressed by these business organizations, that their concerns need to be heard because they haven't been heard by government. In fact, they haven't been consulted. They haven't been engaged. This, Madam Speaker, is a repeated pattern time and time and time again by this Premier and this NDP government, the lack of consultation, lack of engagement. This is the reason why government purports to consult with British Columbians, puts out slide decks on engagegov.bc.ca and doesn't tell anyone, doesn't actually consult, doesn't tell people, British Columbians, you're being consulted with and expects to be able to ram through legislation at the end of session, just like Bill 12 is being done today. This has to stop. Madam Speaker, this is the reason why we're causing so much division by this government in this province over issues like the Land Act amendments, which this government pulled back. This government said it was consulting British Columbians, but didn't tell people that. Concerns were raised. The government replaced that slide deck with another slide deck, but didn't tell, didn't tell British Columbians again that it replaced a new slide deck. This is the kind of government we deal with. We said time and time again in this House, it's been known to be and regarded as the most secretive government in the country. And here we have on Bill 12, Madam Speaker, another example signed by over two dozen of the business associations on behalf of their collective memberships in this province that they have not been consulted about the far-ranging impacts of this bill. And the reason for that, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, the reasons for those concerns, as the Attorney General just spoke to in part, I, for example, in, in her 
pace of her second reading speech, which I listened to as closely as I could, given the pace. I did hear the words flexible, and certainly I will have the opportunity at committee stage with other members of the BC United Opposition Caucus to talk about the future duties, the future obligations on companies that are the target of this bill in the future. So that means, under this broad and flexible, in the words of the Attorney General, the flexibility basically gives any obligation to be imposed on private actors, companies in our province, new obligations and new duties that will fall under this bill. These are obligations and duties that are not yet even defined yet. But Madam Speaker, we know from what has been tabled in Bill 12 is that the bill applies to any product, good, service, or byproduct, which means that this bill would create liability for almost any business operating in or connected to our province. We're not talking just about the social media platforms, the online harms that we've seen for our children and others, including to their mental health in our province. And in fact, Mr. Ms. Madam Speaker, if they were talking about that, I think the bill falls short in that too. Because it's so general in nature that it doesn't get to the specific harms in a way that it ought to, in the way that the federal legislation gets to. Bill C-63. So on one hand, the government presents a bill and this is the way it was reported in the media. This is the, how the, the media thought it was being presented. It would allow the government to sue for health-related costs over damages by companies like social media giants. And energy, and energy drink manufacturers whose products could cause harm. Madam Speaker, I certainly know, and those of us who have had the opportunity to study law, as myself and the Attorney General and the Premier, and the member from Abbotsford West, and the member from West Vancouver Capilano, And there's others, I'm sure, in this house that I've missed. Of course, the Minister for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation himself, as a former law professor at the University of Victoria Law School, where I went to school, that you have fond memories of torts class. And we will obviously get into that detail at committee stage, Madam Speaker, on Bill 12. But Madam Speaker, there's a whole set of obligations and duties and liabilities that is there at common law. When we're talking about, for example, this reference to energy drinks, energy drink manufacturers whose products could cause harm. If that's the target of this legislation, then I think this government should say so. We should be specific. We should understand the focus of this bill, like has been previously said, including under former governments in this province, when we're talking about cigarettes and the opioids themselves. These are the two examples, Madam Speaker, as the Attorney General referred to in her second reading speech, as we understand it, of course. This third piece of legislation, Bill 12, that's being introduced 
is built upon the approaches that are set out in those two acts. But there are big differences, Madam Speaker. The first one I'm pointing out is the fact that it's not targeted, it's not specific. It's not specific to specific industries. It is broad and general in nature. How products are defined sweeps in any product, good or service or byproduct. This is the reason why the associations representing businesses in our province are asking the question, you think government ought to talk to the people who are going to be mis most impacted by this. And again, I appreciate the intention of the bill. I think we have to define the intention. We have to define the impact. We have to define the consequences of the bill. And this is the reason why these associations have stepped forward, put in writing, and asked the Premier and the Attorney General to pause consideration of this bill. I urge this government to consider this letter. I expect that by now, the Premier and the Attorney General are aware of this letter. If they aren't, they can certainly let myself know or our House Leader or others with the official opposition, and we're happy to provide a copy of this letter to you as we have a copy of this letter. I would expect that it's being widely distributed as well. And if I check that, I will see that it is. Because it's been copied and sent to every single MLA in this Legislative Assembly, all 87 of us. So all of us in this chamber and I see my colleague here nodding his head, has received a copy of this letter. You're fully aware, and I would hope that you'll hear from the chapters, the local chapters, including with the BC Chamber of Commerce, in your constituencies about the concerns about this bill. I will say that I mentioned as well, Madam Speaker, in terms of Bill 12, that it also relates to a business operating in or connected to British Columbia. This is where we will get into as well the concerns around the extraterritorial nature of this bill, jurisdictionally. It's the reason why you would expect our federal government to be addressing the concern the Premier and the Attorney General have relating to online social media platforms. And that's what Bill C-63 does. In a more specific, detailed way, and one that the Federal House of Commons is reviewing. Over 83 pages of legislation. This bill is a very broad, ill-defined bill itself, which doesn't get nearly to the same level of specificity, not just in terms of online platforms, but just, just the nature of the wording itself. And this is where we get into businesses that are connected to BC, businesses that conduct commerce and business with British Columbia. As this government presents this Bill 12, in the face of all the affordability challenges we see in this province, the rising costs, the increase in well, immigration, at least in other parts of the country. There are a lot of concerns 
about the future economic platform of our province. This is just another measure in addition to the 32 new and increased taxes this government has brought forward in the last seven and a half years that makes this province potentially less competitive. This is the reason why we need to understand this bill. Because not just British Columbia businesses will have additional costs, whether it's compliance or liability risks, associated with this bill. But potentially, of course, it leads to a lack and a withdrawal of investment in BC-based companies and also the desire of how companies want to conduct business in this province. It presents a very unlevel playing field in our country. This is the reason why we need to be clear about the harms that we're trying to address. And if we're trying to address harmful content on the, you know, considering and protecting the physical and mental health of children and young people and others, to hold online platforms accountable and restrict any form of harmful content in social media, we need a federal bill to do that. That's the reason why the federal government has put that forward. So I can see why business associations do recognize the importance of, of dealing with the online environment, but they question, as I do, the broad and undefined scope of this bill. Another example Madam Speaker, is that the bill itself doesn't just apply to the product or the service that may cause or may contribute to the disease, injury, or illness, but it also applies to any product or service that contributes to even the risk of disease, injury, or illness without any clear criteria for determining these risks or costs. This is what I mean, Madam Speaker, about the dangers of a bill that hasn't been thoroughly consulted and engaged upon with many stakeholders, including business stakeholders, and has terms in it that are not defined. When you sweep in risks, this grossly enlarges the scope of this bill. And when you're doing that and you're not defining risk or setting out clear factors to determine what those risks are, You're setting up a framework for business. Any company or private actor that might be affected by this bill to be operating in an uncertain regulatory environment. We've seen under this government the continued expansion of government overreach. We've seen that with the engineers. We've seen that with healthcare professionals. And I know it's still coming with legal professionals. This is the regulatory environment that this government has been building for the last seven years. I've talked about this house, in this house repeatedly about the concerns around independence, certainly as it comes to the legal profession, and I assume I'll have that opportunity again when the government presents legislation on it. But when we're talking about regulations here to deal with the harms that are not well defined in this bill, and it does it in a way that is not defined 
you have to question what the approach of this government is. Because it's creating a regulatory environment that is going to make it very problematic for business to operate when it's not well defined. How can a board properly assess the risk exposure? And I say that because the bill does provide for joint and several liability for the directors of a company. Under section or clause 13 of the bill. I appreciate that there's a similar provision under the opioid legislation. But Madam Speaker, this is where the bills need to be considered in context. When you have an undefined provision that deals with risk, with no determining factors or clear criteria, and you're asking directors of companies to take on joint and several liability for the cost of health care benefits caused or contributed by the health-related wrong. These are the words in the bill itself. Caused or contributed to by the health-related wrong. Well, you know, causation is one thing. Contribution clearly is another. Having been a lawyer for 20 years advising directors and officers in one area of the law that I practice in a, in a big focus for my practice on corporate governance, I think you'd have to have serious questions about what company boards, directors are signing up for under this bill. Now, I appreciate that there is a due diligence defense of some sort that's spelled out in Bill Clause 13, Sub 3. But it's hard and challenging to match up the risk when it's not well defined. It's one thing to talk about the linkage of a specific type of product Again, we've talked about the general nature of how it's defined here. The causation, if there's harm caused by that product. It's another thing to talk about risk or contribution. This is where this bill, as we break it apart and start to understand it more, I can see why business associations with the benefit of some of the law firms in our province and our country who have been looking at this bill raise alarm bells, raise serious concerns. These are just two that were referred to in this letter. The bill also, Madam Speaker, expands the type and scope of costs that the government could gain recovery for. The Attorney General referred to that in her well-paced second reading speech as well. Uh, when the Attorney General refers to, for example, education or preventative programs or services, that's my recollection of, of her remarks. So Madam Speaker, we're not talking about just the actual cost to government, however that's defined, from the cost to government for the health-related wrong. We're talking about other expenditures broadly defined, broadly referred to, made directly or through one or more agents other 
intermediate bodies or education authorities for programs, services, benefits, or similar matters. So the word similar matters is not a program, it's not a service, it's not a benefit, it's something else. This government is pursuing every single cost available to itself relating to an ill-defined set of products with risks that are not defined. And now we're talking about a broad series of types of costs and expenditures that can be recoverable by government that's associated. Similar matters associated. Well. Now we're talking about association. We're not even talking about contribution or causation. So again, Madam Speaker, on many levels, if I continue down one of the tracks, we've got causation, we've got contribution, now we have association. Well, what's association? A company's conducting business, producing products in this province. Is that association? Well, of course, the answer is no, because association is with the disease, the injury, or illness. So it's not just about association with the province. It's some sort of association with disease, injury, or illness. You know, we, we can get into this uh, in terms of what a similar matter associated with disease, disease would be in the health-related context. I suppose if we're talking again where the government perhaps should be, if they're talking about online harms, we can talk about that. We, we could have debate in this chamber about what are the similar matters associated with disease related to online platforms that are affecting the mental health or physical health of children. That's a debate we could probably be having at committee level, although I will say that I just in imported some general terms from this bill, which are still challenging. But of course, Madam Speaker, we don't have that opportunity because this bill does not limit the application to just the online environment or extreme energy drinks, if that's another example. So Madam Speaker, I'm challenged here because I'm just trying to give examples to the House about the kinds of concerns that this bill presents. And with that, these are the kinds of concerns that industry and business has. Because of course, if we're now talking about all these other types of expenditures, which are not just programs, services, or benefits, but they're similar matters, business, and other persons for whom this bill applies to need to have a clear understanding about what are the range of costs that that person affected by this bill would be exposed to or be responsible for. Again, as a director of a private company, that is trying to address and assess the way their business is currently being conducted in this province of British Columbia with the range of products it produces or services and the types of impacts it might have. It needs to have a clear understanding of exactly what kind of other expenditures, exposures, risks it's taking on. And again, Madam Speaker, the reason why this Bill 12 needs to be paused right now is because it has not had this level of scrutiny and review and engagement and consultation with the business community so that they can properly understand 
what I am demonstrating and trying to convey to the other members of this chamber, the unintended consequences and ill-defined consequences of this bill. Seeing uh, Mr. Speaker, would you like me to note the hour? So I will, uh, noting the hour, I uh, reserve my place in the debate and call for a move adjournment of the debate. Member, you heard the question. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker, Committee of Supply Section A reports progress on the estimates of the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Government House Leader? Next sitting, Speaker. So ordered. Government House Leader. Oh, no, the house is gone. Committee Chair. Mr. Speaker, Committee of Supply, Section C reports progress on the estimates of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy and asks leave to sit again. When shall that committee sit again? Next Come sitting, Speaker. So ordered. Come on, House Leader. I move that House to now adjourn. Member, you heard the question. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1.30 p.m. today.